Adams. Remember what we were doing yesterday? I can actually do a report. Ow. Um, I posted it, but I forgot to go check it later on. Um, you know what we're talking about the end value is the elasticity? Yeah. Elasticity. yeah. How do you know which material to put on the top versus the bottom? I just divide them. I forgot. Uh, it, it doesn't matter which you put on the top or the bottom as long as you apply as you apply that in the right direction. The deal was, and it's true no matter what the shape, the deal was we have two different materials and our regular method for solving for the stresses uh, does not apply for two different materials. We set all that up assuming that the uh, cross sections were prismatic and isotropic, in other words, all one material. Um, I, I don't remember if I actually stated that. It's just all we had. I did state that about the prismatic nature of the beams, the symmetry about the y-axis. But I don't think I stated specifically that it's all one material because we didn't have anything else but all one material. So now that we're talking about the possibility of a second material, that means one of them's a, a tougher material, if you will, one of them's a softer material. And it doesn't matter really which is which as long as you understand that if, we, if we're going to take, let's say this is the, uh, the, the tougher one, the one with the higher, higher uh, modulus, the, the stronger modulus, this one with the weaker modulus, for example, steel and wood, very, very different in terms of their, their lag. Uh, elastic moduli. Uh, you can transform that in either way and it doesn't matter what n is, it doesn't matter whether n is greater than 1 or less than 1 as long as you do it properly in the right way um, and you might do better with a picture and then you just know what to do with n. Um, you can transform it either by taking out this uh, stronger material and you're going to have to put in a lot more of the weaker material so that they can do the same thing. So you would then leave the lower material the same because we're not replacing that. We're going to take out that with a much uh, weaker material. So we're going to need a whole bunch more of it. So clearly you need to increase the, the dimension there B by some factor and uh, the only factor we have is n, so here n must be greater than 1 or it's not going to work in any way. You could also transform the beam by taking out the weaker material, putting in the much stronger, but since it's much stronger we don't need very much of it, so in that case we leave the original stronger material the same and replace it with very little of the weaker material uh, this, uh, sorry, very little of the stronger material to replace that because we don't need as much of it. And so here now, uh, if, if this same dimension there is B, this has now got to be either B over N if N is greater than 1, or if you had N flip, then it, that would be N B as well. So it doesn't matter as long as what you do with it is it results in the same same replacement. Um, and we're only changing the width of it. We're not changing like the length. No. Okay. No. And that's the nature uh, of our prismatic beams: um, the symmetry about the y-axis, but not the symmetry about the other axes. Why uh, it might be symmetric about the other axes, um, but. It's, there's no need for it to be here. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna take up with that, continue that in a very specific application, one you've all heard of, and that's the the use of reinforced reinforced concrete. Now, the, the basic setup here is uh,
given any kind of prismatic beam, and the easiest one to, to draw, of course, is just a rectangular one like that. So we'll, we'll use that. So there's a, a rectangular beam drawn with the techniques we get from technical freehand sketching. So it's got that beautiful perspective to it. So it's, it's you know, I know you guys won't go to a movie now if it's not a 3D movie. So I'm making classes 3D so that it leaps out of the page at you. Um, but let's, let's uh, view it in terms of our standard type of bending where we have bending in the Z direction only. Remember, that's a right-hand rule application. And we'll look at it in terms of our typical type of bending expected for a load-bearing beam, which is where reinforced concrete is used. So that's, a, that's the type of bending that would be what we call positive bending whether it's actually by applied moments there or whether there's, there's load across this beam that causes it to bend like that. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing either way for our purposes because our concern here is that once we look at the stresses on this, now kind of blowing it up in, in much larger cross-section, or much larger, larger side view, we know that somewhere there's a neutral axis that depends upon the cross-sectional shape there. In this case, it happens to be right down the center, so that's convenient, but it doesn't need to be. And across the top, we have tension, and across the bottom, I'm sorry, across the top, we have compression, across the bottom we have tension. So that's that, nothing new there. That's just review from when we started looking at this, this design of prismatic beams. The trouble comes with concrete. Uh, well, the, the, the reason concrete is very useful to use as a, as a building material is you can make it on site you can transport it in uh, those big cement trucks, and then when you get to the site, pour it into the girder shape. You don't have to carry it in the girder shapes down the highways, trying to make those sharp bends through New York City and the like with these with these huge long beams on the on the trucks. That's not true with steel. Steel has to be done uh, has to be fabricated elsewhere, then transported to the site as is. Uh, also, uh, concrete's not terribly expensive. It, for the most part, it's made out of uh, crushed stand, sand and stone and uh, limestone and, and other things like that. Um, so it's, it, it, well, so is steel. Steel's made out of stuff we dig out of the earth as well. But there's a whole other hot, very ener energy intensive step in steel fabrication that's not there with concrete. It's also true that concrete can be poured into shapes that might be aesthetically pleasing as well. If, uh, if we have the bottom of these beams exposed, as if they were here, we can make interesting shapes out of them that might be more pleasing. So maybe we'd make the beam like that, just so the, as, as we see the room as users, there's a softer edge to it all. Um, all kinds of options like that are possible with concrete that aren't as easily done with steel. So that's why s concrete can be a, a very attractive beam material. However, uh, as I've mentioned before, concrete's terrible in tension. It's very good in compression. So it's excellent up here. It's terrible down here where there's tension. So what we do with these type of beams is the top being in tension here, or sorry, in compression, is very good. So we leave that as concrete. Uh, and then as we pour these beams of concrete, we insert at the bottom where all the tension is some 
steel reinforcing bars, what you know as rebar. And you've seen those. You've uh, those are those big long. Bar, actually, if you ever see a building that's been torn down, or if you look at any of those pictures from Tokyo this last week of the buildings that have collapsed, you'll see these spaghetti-like strands all over the place. That's ex that's rebar that has has blown out of the concrete girders that they were in, and then got all tangled as everything collapsed. Um, so we let we let the rebar take all of the tension that's down here, because steel is very good in tension. There's still tension in this concrete, but most of the tension is absorbed by the rebar. Uh, so we need to then model that in terms of uh, uh, our, our composite beam uh, technique that we started with yesterday, because once again, to figure out what the stresses are, we need an isotropic cross-section, a single material cross-section, and we don't have that anymore now with the rebar in there. So we're going to do the same type of thing we did yesterday by transforming that cross-section into a, a slightly different shape. We'll leave the, the uh, We'll leave the, well, I don't want to come down to this neutral axis because it might not be that same place as we'll see. If you remember when we transformed the cross sections yesterday, we had a new neutral axis because we had a new cross sectional shape. So we'll leave concrete up here because that's so good in compression and that's where the compression is. And down here, we'll replace this rebar that's so strong in tension with a whole bunch of concrete, like we were doing yesterday. We took out the tough material, put in a whole bunch of the weaker material to compensate for it. Uh, and remember, this is just our modeling that we're doing this. We don't actually do this. So we're gonna put in a whole bunch of concrete right there where the rebar was. And in fact, the uh, area will be, if we have that much area of the steel rebar, and that's just the cross-sectional area, the, the little uh, rebars, if you cut through them and expose that area, that's, that's the amount of area of the steel that's holding that steel, uh, holding that tension. And then we'll, multiple, we'll, we'll put in an equivalent area of concrete, but n times more of it, because we need so much more of the concrete uh, to take the same tension as just this little bit of rebar was taking. And this is our, our artificial beam then for our design purposes, just for our analysis purposes. The rest of the concrete all that concrete we completely take out of the model. It's so weak in tension that we don't even count it as contributing anything to the uh, strength of the beam. Even this little bit up here where it's just a tiny bit in tension, we take it completely out too and just say the whole thing is, uh, the whole thing is, is, is as if it wasn't even there because concrete's so bad in tension. Yep. We just, we just take it down to the neutral axis? We don't, we don't really no. Notice that the neutral axis of the rectangular section is right here, but right. the nuclear, the neutral axis doesn't account in any way for the fact we have different materials. Once we put in different materials, it, for intents of, all intents and purposes, shifts the neutral axis. So we have a, a new neutral axis, a new place of zero, uh, uh, the transition from compression above to tension below because we had 
uh, dissimilar materials. Uh, so the neutral axis geometrically was here. But remember, we only figure that location of the neutral axis based on areas, not on what the materials themselves are. So when we do put in this, extra, this different material, it does shift the neutral axis. So, uh, so I, I guess our, our tension model would be something like this then. Our, our, uh, sorry, our stress model would be something like this. This is for an isotropic beam. We put in the rebar that shifts the stress profile, shifts the neutral axis uh, to a place where we don't know where it is now. We have to figure out what that is. But we completely uh, replace the steel with a whole bunch of concrete and then completely eliminate the rest of the concrete uh, uh, just assuming that it'll be in tension, that it'll fail and we, we won't even count it. It's it's a, a factor of safety measure, if you will. Ruby's that so hand up? Do we do with the NAS is the width and then the height of it is the no, same as the diameter? The, the, the width we don't care about. We're just taking into account the the total area. The area of the rebar is replaced by n times that area of concrete at the same level. We're not concerned with what that thickness is. That's, that's uh, 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 I guess, more detail than we want to go into as we do it. All right, but we do need to locate this uh, this new neutral axis. So I'll call that distance x. And the easiest way to do this now then is to simply uh, uh, sum up y bar a for anything above the neutral axis and it must equal the y bar a for anything below the neutral axis. That's actually what we were doing with our other calculations when we're using that table. It just, uh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do it like that. Um, uh, but the geometry, the algebra is all exactly the same. So we'll walk through it with a with an example. Then, so here's a here's a concrete beam, five point five inches thick. And four inches down, we put rebar that is, <coughs> excuse me, that is six inches on center. It is four inches down. Uh, kind of messing up where I'm putting my dimension figures. The rebar is four inches down from the top, so there's uh, another inch and a half of concrete below that. Six inch on center with this rebar, and the rebar is <coughs> five eighths in diameter. Picture okay, everybody see what we've got there? Five and a half inches tall, four inches down from the top, we place some rebar that's six inches on center. So 
So our cross section, we can actually save ourselves a little bit of trouble here. We don't need to do the entire width of the beam since it just repeats as it goes along. This could be, uh, for example, an entire floor. You don't have to cast it as, uh, as just a single beam and then lay floor on top of that. You can do rebar, reinstruct, reinforced concrete entire floors. So what we'll do is take just uh, a section midway between two rebar and then just do that much of the model. So uh, all we really need to look at since it repeats, actually let me draw it more to scale. We'll take a piece that's 12 inches across the top because that's the distance between uh, uh, adjacent uh, rebar to the other, but still includes at least two pieces of the rebar within. So now we have uh, three inches in from the side. We have rebar six inches to the next rebar and then another three inches there. That way we don't have to do the entire width of the thing. Um, we can use it we get, it's sort of sort of like a, a unit cell. Uh, then this analysis doesn't need to be changed for however wide we want to do it because it's all just the same thing repeating itself over and over. So we'll just do this one little section and it'll be sufficient to represent as much width of this as we want to do. Is that a fair enough picture then? So uh, we've got four inches down here and then there's another inch and a half below that. So we're just going to analyze a subset of the entire beam um, because it just keeps repeating itself so we'll be fine with that. So we apply our magic arrow of transformation where we take out this rebar and replace it with a whole bunch more concrete. So we'll leave that as concrete because that's the top where the where the compression is and we'll replace the rebar with a whole bunch more concrete of area n times the area of the steel that was, that was there. Let's see, put in some numbers for N here. Uh, uh, what do I have? The way we're doing it, we'll, uh, we'll keep N as greater than 1, so it gives us a whole bunch more of the concrete. So I'll put the steel on top. 29 times 10 to the 6th for the steel. and 3.6 times 10 to the 6th for the concrete. So you can see the concrete is an awful lot lower in the modulus of elasticity. What's that? 8.06. So we've taken out this little tiny bit of area of the rebar and put in eight times more of that same area of the of the uh, of the concrete to uh, be able to absorb that much. So let's see, I have that area 
the, the area of the rebar, that's two bars in my uh, analysis cell, times uh, the area of a 5 8 inch diameter. So that total area of rebar, and, you know, that's just um, uh, pi r squared, but then times 2 because I have two of them. So the equivalent area of the concrete, I don't know if I even have that number on hand here in the little picture. No, not quite. But it's, it's 8.06 times that number. That's the area of this uh, uh, replacement concrete. Okay, so far, The next thing we need to do, of course, is find out just how thick that piece is. We need to locate that neutral axis um, because uh, we're, we're assuming that takes all of the compression above and then all of the tension below is in the, is in the neutral axis. All right, so we'll, we'll use this. Uh, this tends to be a little bit simpler, I think, um, for these kind of shapes. So let's see, y bar above, we know where the centroid of that is, so that's pretty easy to do. So that's a distance x over 2 down, we'll, we'll take the top as the reference. So y bar above is uh, x over 2. That's where the centroid of the upper piece is. By above, I mean above the neutral axis, which we're trying to locate with that num with that value x. And its area, it was 12 inches, so it's 12 by 6. Uh, sorry, x, 12 by x. So that's y bar a above. And the summation means uh, just in case we had an other shapes here. We might have had a, a T shape here or something. In fact, we'll do that kind of example in a second. We just add them up. Take the total area, total Y bar uh, A product above. And that's got to equal the same Y bar A below. Now, let's see. Uh, a is easy, that's NAS. We already got that number. Uh, where it's located though, it's located a distance, let's see, this is four inches down. We're four inches down to that rebar. And so the distance is four inches minus x below the the x-axis. Oh, I'm sorry. This uh, we're not really doing this with a reference. We're we're referring things from the neutral axis. Is that four yeah. inches? So it's four inches from the top is where the rebar is. So right in the middle of the even going there. Yeah. So this distance then. What do you mean to the middle of the beam? Because that four and the other drawing is from. The the top to the, like the from the top down to the rebar. And that's what I drew here, from the top down to the rebar. Right, so the, to the middle of the rebar. Yeah. Okay. So However, don't worry again about the thickness of that piece. Okay. We already know what its area is. We don't care what its width is or its thickness. We care what its area is. Okay. And that's what we've got. And so we, we're essentially assuming it's very, very thin. So this the distance below the neutral axis is then 4 minus x. And so y bar a below the neutral axis, y bar is 4 minus x, and a is n a s. All right, so that's, that's with reference to this neutral axis we're trying to locate not from the top, like I think I said. 
find that OSF. Um, all right. Uh, that's uh, an equation with a single unknown x. We know what n is. That's the ratio of the moduli. We know what AS is. That's the original area of the rebar. And so we can then determine that x is less than so x equals 1.45 inches. That's the distance down from the, that's the thickness of this upper part of concrete that's taking all of the compression. And that's our, that's our new neutral axis, and now we can uh, finish the rest of the calculation uh, to find these stresses. The next part we need, if we're looking for the maximum stresses, we go to C. The next part we need is, is that uh, moment of inertia, moment of area, second moment of area, of the transformed cross-section. That's this piece here, this part there. I of the new cross section, we need, uh, we'll assume M is given, in fact, I'll just give it to you in a second when we need it. It's just one of those plug in numbers that we've got. All right, this is a little bit trickier than, well, it's not trickier, it's actually easier, except that the, the, the little bit of step we might miss is, uh, is um, a, an easy one to forget. Um, remember, we have to do this using the parallel axis theorem for each of the parts of our cross-section. In this case, it's just the concrete above the neutral axis and the replaced steel below the neutral axis. IC, remember, is their uh, um, centroidal moment of inertia. So that's, if you remember for rectangular pieces, is 112 B H cubed, where in this case H for the upper part is X. So it's 112 B, which is our 12 inch width, times X cubed. And that we have, we just found the X. Plus the parallel axis theorem part, which is B times X. And then D is the location of the centroid from the central uh, from the neutral axis, which is one half x in this case, because x is the width of that upper part. And then that's squared, because that's a d squared. That's for that's for just this upper part. What was b x? B b is the width twelve. X is the thickness. Oh, okay. Remember, we just located the neutral axis uh, by saying however much above and however much below the, the sums of those uh, uh, area moment arm or area moments. So that's just the piece above. Now, we need to do the same thing with the part below. Whatever its centroidal moment of inertia is, and I'm going to put that just as IC for right now. I'm not going to do 112 BH cubed because we don't know how wide this is. We don't know how thick it is. I told you to ignore that. We do know its area. It's NAS. 
and then d squared is the 4 minus x that we had before and then that squared. So that's a d squared right there. 4 minus x is the d squared. There's a d squared right there. So that's the contribution below the neutral axis, which remember is located a distance x from the top. Above neutral axis, below neutral axis. All right, here comes the thing that, that uh, actually makes things uh, much easier. Well, not much easier, just some easier. Um, but it's also easy to forget. This moment of inertia of the concrete replacement of the steel, we're going to take as so thin, we don't even care what its thinness is, we're going to take it as so thin that its moment of inertia is zero. And we won't even count it. We won't even bother calculating it. just makes things a little bit easier since we don't know what its thickness is e anyway. We don't know what its, what its width is. We, uh, we, could, we could, I guess, pick values, but that's as artificial as anything we're doing anyway. So all these numbers we have, B is 12, X is the 1.45, N is 8.06, area is the 0 0.614. We've got all those numbers. So we can just plug everything in, calculate those numbers. Should come out to 44.4 inches to the fourth. Remember, that's the the uh, moment of inertia of the transformed cross-section. And so then now uh, we can figure out the uh, maximum stresses for uh, each of the pieces. The top is in compression, the bottom is in tension. So we're doing that in the concrete. Remember, that's what we left there. So we just do the straight MCI, where C is actually X, the distance to the top of the concrete from the neutral axis. Uh, we're looking at just the concrete uh, in compression above. Oh, and I'll give you a moment now to, uh, to just hang all this on. 40 kip inches. And so we've got all these numbers now. 40 kip inch is the moment C for the upper part of the concrete here in compression, for the distance, the farthest distance of the material from the neutral axis, because remember, the farther away we are from the neutral axis, the more the stress grows. So that C is the same as X, in this case, 1.45. So that's part of the ease of calculating X from the top, because we're going to need that number several times. And then I is what we just calculated, the 44. 0.4 inches to the fourth. So we'll get kips per square inch. That's the compressive stress in the upper part of the concrete. Kips per square inch, 1.31. In compression. Now, for the steel, in tension below the, we're going to assume the steel takes 
all of that tension. Remember, that was our transformation. We assume that none of the concrete below can absorb any of the tension, even though it, it can certainly absorb some. That's going to be n times the very same numbers, except that we have a different C. This is the uh, concrete C. This is the steel C, because they're different distances from the neutral axis. The steel can hold a lot more stress, so you know we have to multiply by N. And we already have all the units worked out from the same number above. The steel distance from the neutral axis is the 4 minus X, which is, uh, uh, what, 2.55, I think. Yeah, 2.55. And then over the I that we already have. And so that comes out to be 18.5. Much, much more than the steep, uh, the, sorry, the concrete could stand. Because the steel can hold a lot more stress than the concrete can, so you know it must be bigger. The stresses in the steel must be bigger. That's why we put the steel down there, because it can hold so much more stress. If you divide by the 8.06 or have the N upside down, then this is going to be a very, very small number. And your, your calculation is going to be that there can be almost, there, there's no stress anticipated down here, you might as well put in the Kleenex, which is not well known as a structural material. All right, you, 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 uh, you know from the direction these things should be. This has got to be a lot bigger because that's the steel. The steel can hold a lot more stress. All right, so now the, this, this, the stress profile looks something like, let's see, a maximum of 1.3 up there, and then uh, the, the compressor, the, sorry, the tension in the concrete 18.5 so that's tension that's compression and so our profile will look like that now remember we're assuming that this concrete that's down here takes none. actually uh, since we're assuming that this concrete takes none of it our stress profile is actually like this. Sorry, the, the uh, let me try to make it a little bit more accurate. Here's the bottom of the beam. Here's the steel. It's the steel that can take this 18.5. but the steel itself is really only that thick. That's the part that's in tension, because remember, we're assuming that the rest of that concrete can't hold any of the tension. We've taken it completely out of the calculation. So I guess that would be our true stress profile uh, for our design purposes, because we're assuming that the rest of this concrete can't absorb any of that tension anyway, certainly not this much. 
So we just take it out of the calculation entirely. Man, a lot went by there, huh? Now this is just for that 12 inch section, right? So if you had like a whole yeah. floor that was 10 feet long, would you just multiply those numbers by 10 or would it be more? No, time? no, because the, the width uh, it, it just repeats itself, you know. There's there's more load as it gets wider, but we have more material holding the load by the same amount. So uh, this is the cross section. Uh, the depth we assume to be the same all the way along. Uh, in real design, you're going to have to take into account that things change at the sides because there's different supports here. There's different loads expected there. Um, this is this is adequate for the center of the beam. We don't need to change any of the numbers for the increasing width because it just it just repeats itself over and over. Okay. Let's see, we got oh, we got ten minutes for you to do your own problem. Jake wishes he was back on the boat. All right, here's a, reinforced concrete TV. Four inches here, eight inches on those, uh, the width of the flanges. 18 inches top to bottom. Six inch thickness down there. And two inches up from the bottom, we have two rebar. Because if this is a typical floor beam, that bottom part is going to be in tension. Top part is going to be in uh, compression. So uh, concrete's great in compression. We'll just leave it alone. All right. Assume. For the concrete, the maximum allowable stress is 3 KSI. Of course, that'll be the top part in compression. And for the rebar, assume a tension maximum allowable stress of 40 KSI. Nowhere near what the concrete could handle alone. So that's the purpose of the rebar there. Oh, the, the rebar diameters are one inch. So find the maximum allowable moment then. So the type of thing where you've got these beams available, they're uh, right out of the catalog, easily manufactured. So you want to find out what the maximum moment, oh sorry, oh no we've got this. Uh, 22 inches across the top, but that's the 8 plus the 8 plus the 6. Using the same end. Sorry? Using the same end. No. Oh, uh, yeah, same. Uh, no, I've got slightly different numbers for some reason.
29 times 10 to the 6th PSI over 3.8 times 10 to the 6th PSI. So for whatever reason, slightly different ones. You know, there'd be a factor of safety in all of these calculations anyway. Okay, I can speed you up with some of the numbers. The area of the rebar, those two one-inch diameter rebar, will have an area of 1.571. So N times AS, which will be the area of the concrete you replace, 11.99 inches squared. Alright, so we're going to leave the concrete alone up top. above the neutral axis, and we don't know where that is, remember, because that's the neutral axis of the transformed section. Figure it's going to be somewhere in there. And then we take out all the bottom concrete and all the rebar and replace it with a big, long, fat strip of uh, concrete to absorb the stress. So we need to figure out where that neutral axis is. And remember that's by balancing Y bar A above, which is now a composite shape, uh, but it's two simple rectangles. And that's got to be equal to Y bar A below, which will allow you to place the neutral axis. In fact, uh, of all the calculations, that's probably the toughest one, so let's do that uh, for now. I happen to do it like this. We already know the thickness here is four inches, so what we really need is that distance there uh, as the only unknown. So uh, if you do it that same way, then we can compare numbers easily. And that, of course, makes that distance 16 minus x, because that's where the rebar is, 16 inches down from the bottom of the flange. This two inches of concrete below the rebar we're throwing out of the calculation. In fact, if you want to see this business in action, it's very easy in New York State because all of our bridges are crumbling. If you drive under the bridges, you'll see a lot of this concrete cracked and breaking away and even rust colored because now the rebar is getting exposed to uh, water and salt. And so underneath all the bridges, you'll see the big chunks of this concrete is, is popping off and just the rebar is left. So you might want to become religious as you go over New York State bridges. All right, see what you can get for X. Um, that seems to be the uh, the trickiest part of the calculation. I is a little bit tricky. Remember, I is for the transformed cross section. got a couple areas here and that D remember is measured from this this uh, new neutral axis of the transform cross section Got it already? 
are you, Frank? You're so fast on this stuff. You must uh, just cheat or something. Remember that X, as I calculated, is from the bottom of that T. So if you do that same thing with compare numbers. Ruby. What's right, right now here? Um, I get confused on finding a live bar without doing a little chart thing. Uh, well, so if, if that's easier for you to do it that way, do it that way. So live bar at the top. Yeah, for, for the top, Y bar A, you probably want to break it into two pieces. That piece and that piece. And so above, we know that Y bar for piece one is going to be X plus half of that, which is two, two plus X. And then the whole area of that piece one is what? 22 by 4. That's piece one. Piece two then, its y bar uh, is actually x over 2. Remember x, we don't know. That's what we're looking for. And its area is 6 by x. That's piece 2. All right, Doobie, that makes sense? So it, it's, once you write out, it's, it's not really worth the table. But you can certainly do it that way if you'd like. And then for the bottom piece, its y bar is 16 minus x, and its area is NAS. And then that'll give you an equation for x. be actually up here but if you uh, if you do that I guess the X would come out negative you, it's, it's, you sort of visually are balancing these things if you, if you cut these out of cardboard then they balance at some place about where X is and remember this is uh, underdrawn by quite a bit. That's actually almost 12 square inches. We know that y bar for piece one is two plus x. Y. That's that a uh, piece one. That's y bar. It's the distance of the centroid of section one from the neutral axis, which is x plus two because that's four. So it's halfway across that piece. So it's two plus x down to the neutral axis. Oh, okay, because so we don't have references. Yeah, we, we, we don't have to reference this from the top or the bottom. We do it all from the uh, neutral axis. Oh, all right, that's what I'm thinking. So yeah, I, I think I, or I, I mis misplayed that on the, the very first part when I was introducing it. And then point two is this, or piece two is the same. Thing. All right, we're at the end of time. I got to run to the other class, so let me give you these numbers as I have. You can double check them. So x drawn from the bottom of the flange there is point one five seven three inches. And then I 
remember the centroidal moment of inertia of this strip. You take a zero, so uh, you'll have pieces one, two, and then that bottom piece to contribute to the moment of inertia. 35, 35, 7. So see if you get those same numbers. Inches to the fourth. And then you have to calculate a maximum moment for each of these because one of them is going to fail before the other and then you have to take whichever one is lowest. So the maximum moment for the concrete is 25.51 based on the concrete limit. Kip inches. Then you have to redo that calculation for the steel. Remember, N will be in there, and there'll be a different C distance from the neutral axis. That that you get 1170. So that will be the controlling one because it's smaller. If you put a moment of 2551. The concrete would be okay, but the steel would fail. All right. We need this class to be four hours, not three.